Welcome back to my animal education series. Today I'm here with Sam at the National Tiger Sanctuary. Hello. How are you doing? Doing good. And who do we have here? This is Banshee. This is one of our female mountain lions living on the sanctuary. The only native species that we have exist, or uh, native carnivore we have living on the sanctuary today. And you call it a mountain lion, and I also understand that they have many, many, many other names. <laughs> yep. So I call it a mountain lion because I grew up in Kansas, and though Kansas happens to have mountains, we, that's what we know this animal as. It is technically a cougar. That is its technical terminology is to be known as a cougar. But I will never call anyone wrong for calling it a mountain lion, a puma, a cougar, catamount, Florida panther, ghost cat, red tiger, deer tiger, because those are all titles that are associated with this animal. The reason you see so many names is this is actually an animal that can be found everywhere from the Yukon of Canada down to the Andes of South America. This massive, massive range actually being the second largest of a land mammal in the Western Hemisphere outside of humans, resulting in a lot of people see them they all give them a different title. Because not like you know, up in Canada and South America and Mexico and Florida, and they all like communicate and met up one place like, okay, this is what we're <laughs> all gonna call this. There's, each different region has their own names for it. Exactly, so it's, it's very common to hear, hear different variations in title, but if you really want to be correct, you're gonna call it a cougar, so. And really, whenever you see this, everyone knows what it is. Mm -hmm. No matter what name you say, people know what it is. Mm -hmm. So what do these animals eat in the wild? So again, being a native species, they, again, they are a very wide range in prey. Um, being in this area, native to this area, they're going to hunt, again, things as small as rabbits, uh, up to your deer, your large ungulates. So again, a huge, huge prey range, being a super opportunist. Now again, these will range in size anywhere from Banshee here, who's, a, who's on the smaller side, around 100 pounds, up to your big males up north, who can be 200 plus pounds. And so you see this cat. big, big animals. You see this big or size range, which will again allow for a much very much larger variation in prey size as well. And there is a subspecies down in uh, Florida, it's like the Florida panther, I believe it's called. Yep. So it's a very unfortunately a, a pretty threatened subspecies down in Florida, known as the Florida panther. Uh, again, exact same species as what we're mm -hmm. seeing right here, but but will look a little different. They are typically a taller cat with a little bit longer legs. Just for more like wetlands. Yep. Adapt to their their environment. They've evolved to adapt to that environment specifically. Where Banshee is going to be what you typically will see around this area, where she's a stockier animal, so she can deal with the colder weather, but not necessarily uh, the biggest biggest cat that you would see up north in their northern part of the range either so and how did this cat get here so banshee was also another cat that came from private ownership now fortunately banshee's private ownership was probably one of the better ones banshee was really really had a pretty decent life prior to her arrival with us um, she arrived on the sanctuary after her owner had unfortunately passed away and her family did not feel that they could keep her any longer and so we gladly accepted banshee now again because of banshee's uh private previous life had a much easier time adapting to the sanctuary uh than some of the other cats that have come from the more neglectful and, and abusive situations do you have any idea like what the previous like, enclosure the setup was? Very similar to what we have here. So very, that was a, a big fortunate thing is that as far as her enclosure, it's similar to what we have on the, the facility today. And Banshee was really not interacted with a whole lot. And that's the big thing is they did not really have hands-on contact with her. And that, that's what, what why we think she adapted as well as she has on the sanctuary. I think she didn't have like a personal contact with only one individual. Yep. So she just kind of yeah. was there. Exactly. And how did you guys work around that? Did you just like, kind of work with her and get uh, her like get her used to like, us being around yep so anytime we rescue any animal um, the first thing you have to understand is we're never going to immediately throw them on tour we're never going to immediately throw them in a period place where they're going to have to deal with people because it's not fair for them they mm -hmm. have to get used to being on the sanctuary they have to get used to us we have to get get to know them there are cats that don't deal with people we have animals on the sanctuary that just don't like people and for them it's not fair to have to deal with people and so they have their own private habitats where they're not interacted with by people but we just slowly work around them uh, banshee again is a very easy cat cat banshee adapted very very quickly and so we were able to identify different or do different things with her at a lot quicker pace where our other mountain lion on the sanctuary tiki was with us for three years before we ever thought about doing anything with the public with her she just was very 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 aggressive and did not trust people at all how old was Banshee when you got her? So Banshee, oh man, I think you know. Oh, so Banshee would have been about five years old when she arrived on the sanctuary. Today she is going on twelve years old. So. Is that old or a? Uh in captivity, not necessarily. Um, in the wild, because they are having so much more competition, the, the, the danger that is hunting in itself of hunting large prey, uh, you're seeing a much shorter life expectancy in the wild. Um, 
early to mid teens, relatively normal life expectancy for a medium sized cat. In captivity, again, late teens, maybe into the early 20s is not out of the question for Banshee, so. And it seems kind of a very like generalized animal for all these different like, habitats. So what are some of these adaptations that these um, like mountain lions and these cougars have? So as far with your, your with your big cats, big cats are probably the most well-designed predator there is. <laughs> um, they are, because of just their their adaptations. Again, their some of the, the just generic adaptations is obviously the retractable claws, the the heavy bite force that it comes from, the amount of jaw power they have. Um, within the species specific, within you're talking about mountain lions. There, what we see with all these big cats to be specific is is you bring a lion into Missouri, people would think, oh, it would get cold. Don't really get cold. <laughs> they they have a harder time dealing with the heat, and so with your mountain lions necessarily to adapt to the conditions, what you're going to see is body size changes. So again, up north in the the much higher uh, portion of their range, there's a harsher condition, a much colder environment. You're going to see a larger, bulkier animal, one that is more designed to deal with those those heavier conditions. When you're moving into the hot, warmer parts of the range, you're going to see a more slender animal, one that is not carrying as much weight because that heavy weight is going to be a lot harder for them to deal with the heat when it comes. It just like Banshee will get a much bigger winter coat. So she grows fur just like you uh, to get to, to prepare for winter. She'll shed it out to prepare for summer. So they have various adaptions that you see in most species. But typically, as far as adapting to the different environments, what you're going to see is body size. That's going to be the main variation. And obviously, again, the whole large range, it was a very adaptable animal and for all these different kinds of environments and situations. So are they endangered or threatened in any way? Fortunately, not right now. Um, for a long time, and especially the United States range and the North American range, you did see these animals become very, very threatened, and that was purely based off human interaction. Again, uh, these animals would commonly prey on livestock. It's an easy prey for them. Obviously, farmers did not like that, and so they were hunted to a point where they were becoming, you did not see them in their natural range hardly at all. Now, due to heavy conservation efforts, heavy uh, reintroduction programs, we have seen these populations rebound very, very well. Now, we're still seeing that in Missouri. We, uh, we're still seeing animals move in and out, but they have not fully taken back their overall range yet. But it is likely in the near future you're going to see uh, a steady population grow, um, which is a big benefit because what this animal represents is North, one of North America's best predators. And one of the things that when you lose a predator, um, what you're de really dealing with is at that point, there's nothing to stop the prey from doing what they want to do. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest issues in where I'm from in Kansas is we have just endless numbers of deer. And one of the biggest things that has affected that is the deer no longer have a natural predator because the mountain lions really helped reduce their population because it made the deer think, we can't just go out and do what we want basically and, and kind of putting them in a human characteristic. Um, so honestly, the reduction, and, and you see that with all big species, that's what you're going to see with your tigers and your other big large carnivores. When those populations uh, disappear, you're going to see a lot of imbalance within the natural food chain. And we saw that very heavily with the mountain lions. Unfortunately, that has started to kind of rectify itself as this population has grown back into its natural range. And the whole the kind of food chain of the ecosystem gets messed up with the, with the predator being less, the prey becomes more, then it's less and grasses and being yep. the spray everywhere. And in terms of deer, deer are gonna get in people's yards, they're gonna be on the roads and hit more. Mm -hmm. It just the, the one little thing with the mountain lions moving out just messes up everything. Yep, so it is it is a very, very fragile web that can be really upset by just losing one one piece. And so it, it's very important to remember that that just because hey, this mountain lion killed a piece of livestock it also was responsible for reducing the number of rabbits you had in your yard that ate your vegetables. <laughs> and so they, they play a very, very big role in, in the natural ecosystem, and it, it is important to keep them in that role because it, they help balance the whole system out. And like, even if they are killing livestock, maybe it's like one cow for like 10 deer that they killed. Mm -hmm. like obviously, the farmers still not going to like that. That's 10 deer that's still not impeding on their land and eating their crops. Exactly. And, and it's not even just the, kill, uh, the, the reduction of the uh, physical reduction of population of deer. It, it, allow, it forces the deer to not be as brazen, basically. Mm -hmm. They can't spend as much time out in the open because that allows them to become a heavier amount of prey. Seen there. Um, obviously. And so, so it, it actually forces the animals to 
go back into their natural kind of order. We saw a lot of this within, not to get too far out of the we saw a lot of this in Yellowstone when they reintroduced the wolves into that area. Um, we saw the deer stop utilizing the, the river systems as much, which actually allowed the rivers to re reestablish themselves into what they were because they didn't have the super heavy traffic of the deer. So you see it in all systems with carnivores and, and these big cats are some of the best carnivores there are. So and you mentioned Yellowstone. I don't remember who uploaded this video, but it was a great uh, video to explain how like how the wolves changed mm -hmm. the rivers in Yellowstone yep. and how everything's connected, how all the entire ecosystem changed from the introduction of a couple of wolves. Exactly. So that that's so if someone can find that video, that would, uh, be an awesome video. I highly recommend it. That's a that's an excellent. It's a, it is an excellent. It's how the wolves change the rivers. It's a really great documentary, a short documentary about that. But that is a great example of what the 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 fragile nature of the food chain and the fragile nature of our ecosystem, how removing an important piece like our mountain lions, like the tigers and the, and the African lions can really affect the overall balance of the ecosystem as a whole. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people just don't think that. A little piece of the puzzle affects everything else connected to exactly. it. Exactly. And with Yellowstone and with the mountain lions, it happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everything's connected. Yep. Well, thank you so much uh, for telling us about the mountain lions and a bunch of other ecosystems that we touched on on the end there. And as always, I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and also check out my Instagram, at Cole Shirk. As always, I'll see you next week.